Um, for those of you whom I have not yet met, my name is Charlie Fuchs, and about seven weeks ago I uh, joined Yale as the uh, next Kansas Senate Director, and I, I just want to thank all of you for coming to this town hall. Curiously enough, I was talking to Renee, who, uh, who arranges uh, this Kansas Center Grand Rounds, uh, and just a few days ago on Thursday, I said to her, you know, I, I think I'd like to uh, um, present a, a vision for the Kansas Center, and I think I'm scheduled to give Grand Rounds in a couple of months, and she said, no, actually, you're scheduled to give it in four days. <laughs> so uh, it was quite, it was, it was, uh, quite fortunate that uh, the timing worked out just right. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's really been my privilege to join the Yale and Spilo community seven weeks ago. And really, in the two months before I started, and in the seven weeks since I've started, I've, I've really just appreciated how you all have made me feel so welcome. Um, I've had a chance to meet with many of the great and talented faculty and staff of our institution, and obviously, over the coming weeks and months, I look forward to meeting many more of you. Um, but even though I haven't had a chance to talk with everyone, I've really had a chance to listen. And I've learned a lot. And I think what we all share is a firm commitment and dedication to aspire to be something even greater than we are today, which is altogether superb, um, and to expand the, bet, the depth and breadth of our programs. And so what I'd like to do, based on that consensus, and I think where we agree we want to go, is to share with you over the next 40 minutes a proposed vision and strategy going forward. So um, I do plan to cover a broad range of endeavors, because we work in a comprehensive cancer center, and our mission includes a clinical mission, a research mission, an educational mission, among others. And and obviously, all of these components are critically interrelated. We recognize that our success as a tertiary and quaternary care center is critically linked to our innovation in cancer research. And as such, I, as you'll hear, I propose that we expand our already superb talent by recruiting additional uh, outstanding clinicians and researchers, and at the same time invest in both the infrastructure uh, and the strategic centers that will advance our research mission and allow us to have a, a greater impact in science. Um, moreover, um, we want to grow the clinical enterprise, but to do so, I think we have to apply the same spirit of innovation that we do in research beyond what we do normally in terms of novel therapies and technologies, and I mean to include innovation in thinking how we provide care, the services we offer, and the methods to which we engage our patients, uh, their families, and our referring docs. So really, over the next 40 minutes, I'll share my perspectives on where I think we are and where I'd like us to go. So one thing I think we can all firmly agree is that the past seven years have uh, really witnessed an extraordinary transformation in all dimensions of our cancer center. I think uh, Yale has had a long and valued tradition in science, but our cancer center over the past seven years has grown clinically. Uh, it has grown in terms of its research mission and its educational mission, and, and that's an area that we all take great pride. Um, but, you know, the arrival of a new cancer center director allows us to step back a moment and to consider the next chapter, namely time to take stock, to revisit our assumptions, to define the next opportunities, and strategically uh, take it to the next level once we've identified those opportunities. This, uh, for those of you who periodically glance at the Harvard Business Review, this is actually a classic article uh, in which Collis and Ruckstad emphasized the importance of having a thoroughly vetted strategy that can be enunciated, recognized across all levels of an organization. Um, still, the authors recognize that an effective strategy must arise from a hierarchy of statements uh, as you can see, uh, uh, 
a vision, a mission, and values. And, and I think we do want to address all of these things in due time, but what's very clear is that, uh, you know, to arrive at a strategy, which is really want to talk about uh, this hour, you have to realize what's your vision. That is, what do we want to be? Um, and curious enough and coincidentally, uh, the subject of our vision came up at a meeting last week. For those of you who may not be aware, the uh, health system has engaged uh, a management consulting firm, ECG, to look at the various service lines and plan for growth over the next three to five years, one of which is the cancer service line. And in their presentation to us last week, they actually talked about our vision. Uh, and as you can see, they offered some visions from a number of fine centers. Well, I can tell you that, that what's on the bottom there didn't work. It's fairly vanilla. There are some verbiage on the bottom that, um, that we didn't think made sense. And, um, and so actually, uh, I then went back and Googled to see, well, what is the vision statement for Smilo Cancer Hospital? And uh, for those of you who may be more sophisticated with the internet, I welcome you to, to do this as well. I can't find it. Um, I found the vision statement for Yale New Haven Health, which is superb. It doesn't have the word cancer in it. So, um, so as a result, I, uh, I decided that in anticipation of today's town hall, I would try to craft an alternative uh, version beyond the management consultants. And uh, let me suggest, you know, don't try this at home, because at the moment I, I live alone in an apartment. My wife is actually uh, still residing in Massachusetts. So what I did one evening last week is I kept texting her uh, vision statements. And she would respond with various emojis. In fact, I saw the range of emojis. Uh, but it got better over time. And here's what my wife and I arrived at, uh, really to capture who we are, what we want to be, the fact that we're a matrix cancer center, that we leverage great talent, and ultimately that our focus is on individuals confronting the diagnosis of cancer. So a world leader in cancer care research and education, Smilo Cancer Hospital delivers the transformative scientific discoveries and care innovations of Yale Cancer Center and Yale New Haven Health to bring us closer to a world free of cancer, one patient at a time. Um, I tried to avoid sort of the vanilla statements you'll see at most major cancer center, centers and, and really to capture, I think, who we are and what we want to be. Now, uh, for those of you who uh, tend to spend more of your time not in the cancer hospital part, but the cancer center part, well, uh, these things are somewhat interchangeable. And so if we were to operate on two internet platforms, which we might, um, well, it would be similarly designed. But, and this is something we can vet as, uh, as a group and in meetings. But you know, from my standpoint, talking to people, this is where I think we start, that we, we leverage our communities, all our resources, to provide something to patients in need. So um, you know, as we uh, think about where we want to go, I want to sort of take stock and drill down on where we've been and what we've accomplished. So I think, as I mentioned, over the past five years, we've seen dramatic growth in our clinical enterprise. But you know, I think we're at a point now where we want to strategically define what are the opportunities for growing our clinical enterprise further. And at the same time, we've grown so rapidly, and in any organization that has achieved rapid growth, it, it sort of insists that you revisit your operational efficiencies to make sure that you're using your resources and space uh, to the maximum benefit. Um, our network, I think, has been a model of success, which I'll talk about. And I think we are now the preeminent provider of cancer care in the state of Connecticut. Um, but one thing we realize is that there is now emerging. Our success has spawned the interest of our colleagues, both north and south, and there is emerging competition as well as regulatory challenges to expanding our footprint. Um, but we want to continue that growth and expansion, and at the same time want to make sure that we always coordinate the care so that we're providing outstanding care, be it on this campus or the alternative campuses, 
and that we identify faculty at all centers that uh, are of the highest quality. Um, we have launched uh, a system-wide uh, metric-driven high-quality care, um, and I think what we want to do with that is to become the leader in value-based care um, because realize that the payers are going to want to dictate the rules. Um, and instead, we want to be the ones through our research initiatives to help we decide what is high quality care and how is it measured. Um, we've seen extraordinary growth in our clinical trials enrollment and our portfolio, as well as the staff model for our clinical trials office. We've quadrupled enrollment to clinical trials over the past five to six years, and we've doubled the number of individuals working in our clinical trials office. But uh, I think we want to continue to expand enrollment and the portfolio of our studies, including advancing investigator-initiated research and moving Yale science into the clinic. And we also want to identify, uh, are we doing it the best way? Or is our process efficient? Are we activating studies on time? Are we ensuring the best enrollment? Are we including the appropriate correlatives, including on-treatment biopsies, that will allow us to leverage these trials to really understanding the science. Um, with regard to science, I think there has been an increasing commitment to cancer-focused research and a number of team science grants that many of the individuals here have successfully gotten, SPORE grants, U grants, supplements to our Cancer Center grant. But nonetheless, we want to increase cancer-focused research. We want to create even greater opportunities for collaborative science. And most importantly, I would suggest that we want to advance translational research and build the infrastructure to conduct those types of studies. Um, we've seen great improvements in our training programs, as well as in recruitment to our training programs and our faculty. But uh, I think we want to further enhance recruitment, retention, training, uh, and career development, because these are critical for our mission. We have, I think, a superb and committed development staff who are raising money uh, for cancer research and our clinical enterprise, but realizing that as we create new and ambitious goals, we are absolutely going to need to expand our philanthropic funding, uh, possibly by an order of magnitude, um, which is a lofty goal, but I think essential for us to move forward. And at the same time, I think when you look at the relationships between the School of Medicine and the hospital and the university, I think that the cancer service line is really the model of collaboration, and I would suggest the individuals in the lead on all of those institutions would agree on that front, but I think we must never overlook that our success as a cancer center, as a cancer hospital, depends, I think, on us relentlessly continuing that seamless integration and eliminating the borders through every step of the way, because if we can do that, we minimize the inefficiencies and we ensure much greater success. So, um, you know, this was the model of the cancer center when I got my start, right? So there was cancer research, there was clinical care, and the focus being the patient, and a fairly simple and relatively linear model. But this is what we have become as a cancer center realizing there are a number of disciplines, all of which we value, provide important support for the mission, but the bottom line is there are a lot of balls in the air. Um, and for us to succeed requires us to achieve excellence, I think, in all of these arenas, and moreover, to uh, make sure that we coordinate the efforts to minimize the efficiencies and maximize synergies. So turn it, for a start, how are we doing clinically? And as I mentioned, I think um, we've had considerable growth. So uh, this past year, we had over 200,000 patient visits across the cancer, clinical cancer enterprise. Um, and when you look at the breakdown between the uh, York Street campus and the network, you can see that we've really grown 
in both arenas. Um, about 55% of our visits are seen on this campus, but 45% are actually seen in the network. Moreover, we had about a 7% growth in new patient visits this past year and 13% growth in the network. Just to be clear, that kind of growth in a large academic health center is relatively unprecedented um, and hardly ever sustained. In terms of surgery, our programs continue to grow, uh, and I think the opportunities to grow further with a search for a new chair of surgery and expansion of the network, I think, is an exciting opportunity. And at the same time, we really are the premier provider of therapeutic radiology, radiation oncology. Now, you can see the number of trips, uh, treatments is dipping a little bit, but that's a phenomenon that occurs because to the credit of our radiation oncologists, they are figuring out how to deliver care with fewer fractions and to do it more effectively, cheaper, and better, better, with better quality for the patient. So I think realizing that the trends at any major academic center is a decline, this really represents extraordinary volume in our radiation oncology program. So in terms of the aims, well, aim one, as you can see, because fortunately it's at the top of the slide, strategically advance the clinical enterprise as a premier cancer center and leader in high quality, innovative, patient-focused clinical care regionally and nationally. And to do so, uh, I think we will want to implement a series of, of, of strategic plans. First, to recruit outstanding faculty in, within, with a disease focus to our disease programs. And what do I mean is, you know, a specific phenotype, namely individuals who either have a penchant, a commitment, a track record of building successful clinical and translational programs. And I think these are the kind of individuals which may be junior, mid-level, or senior level recruits uh, that we'll want to uh, bring to Yale to really advance not only the clinical enterprise, but our efforts and commitment to increasing translational research. Now, in what areas should that be? Well, the obvious ones, I think, are in those high prevalent areas, um, and you can see most of that slide. That's actually the breakdown of diagnoses in the Smilo Yale system, which actually, if you can't see the whole slide, I can tell you it essentially it matches the breakdown of diagnoses across the United States. So because we are such a comprehensive provider across Connecticut and the region, we, unlike many cancer centers, we don't really have a very skewed uh, population towards one diagnosis or another. So certainly the high prevalent cancers will want to recruit individuals to. But as well, I think there may be unique opportunities where we have great science, where it's part of our value proposition of Yale, where the less prevalent areas will want to recruit that particular phenotype. At the same time, I think to facilitate and advance research within disease areas, I think we've agreed uh, at the executive committee to actually at this year's cancer center retreat to, to ask the DART leaders, the disease center leaders, to present uh, the, uh, each of their programs with a specific template that we'd like to give them where we see how they're doing in specific domains and to evaluate this in a constructive manner, mind you, but to really identify what are the opportunities going forward so we assure that we really are providing a comprehensive approach to both clinical care, clinical research, translational research, and linkage to our research programs in each of our major disease programs. At the same time, I think there's areas that we now recognize and have recognized that we need recruitment to. So, we have been, for some time now, undergoing a surge for a leader of our bone marrow transplant program. Um, we're actually reconvening that group, uh, Madhav and I, and we're meeting, I think, in two weeks, and we're really committed to finding a really exceptional leader for that program so that we can really uh, take what is a, a superb clinical program to an even greater strength. At the same time, I think leveraging the extraordinary depth in immunobiology and in parallel with our recruitment to stem cell transplant, and given the investment in the cell manipulation lab, we'll want to recruit an individual, ah, progress, to cell therapies. 
So an area that I think we'll want to simultaneously recruit, particularly once we've identified, and hopefully soon, our leader in stem cell transplant. A number of other key programs that we are already advancing, uh, Jen Capo and Ruggiero Lillenbaum and others, I think are looking to expand our footprint in palliative care, not only be because it's, it's an important part of cancer care, but because it's, it's our value proposition, that is focusing on that end of care because it will ultimately improve the quality of care for patients and it will probably reduce events like hospitalization. So we want to expand that. Beyond on the other end, cancer survivorship. There are an increasing millions of individuals now uh, living as cancer survivors, and that is something we want to think through carefully in terms of clinical care and in terms of clinical research. Certainly the emotional needs of our patients are vitally important, and we want to look at psycho-oncology and social work. Complementary care, which I think is uh, something that many patients and families are now looking for. We want to be in the business of cancer prevention. Um, and I learned at a meeting earlier today that our system, our health system, is responsible through its employees for about 40,000 covered lives, just because they're linked through the insurance uh, for, as for our employer. And that, for starters, is a good area to really to test our efforts in cancer prevention in healthy populations. And as well, I think we want to invest in new technologies, therapeutic radiology and surgery, because it is what we do as a cancer center. So we need to think about, do we want a proton center? Do we want other things in surgical care that might be vitally important as we advance not only what we can offer clinically, but in terms of our research enterprise? At the same time, we recognize vital infrastructure needs. Namely, uh, we want to make sure that every patient has access to high quality, rapidly available, CLIA uh, approved genomic profiling. And that moreover, that that data is downloaded into a clinically useful database that we can all access and so we can ask questions to support our research. So if we're contemplating a trial on BRAF mutated cancers. We can know how many of those patients we've seen here and at the networks. We can also hopefully link it to the clinical data and ask some at least high level questions that can facilitate our research. At the same time, as I mentioned, I think we want to be a leader in metric driven care. And that investment is not only, I think, in our clinical programs but in our cancer center outcomes programs, because I think linking those two will, uh, will actually allow us to better understand the business we're in. And so as part of that, I want to get to the point where we all have access to a comprehensive, transparent dashboard of what we do here clinically, in our research, in terms of our clinical and trial enrollment. So, you know, we're all here because, well, we got to Yale because we had really good report cards. We respond well to report cards, and I want to continue that, not as a, uh, as a concern, but as an opportunity for something to take pride in and for something for us to regularly revisit as we constantly reshape our strategic initiatives. Um, and finally, as we continue to grow clinically, we realize that there are growing pains, uh, namely in terms of how we use our space and resources. And I've heard from a few people that, well, maybe we are outgrowing the footprint of this fine new building uh, that Joel Smilo endowed. Um, well, uh, then the, I can tell you that the leadership at both the school and the hospital side are committed to addressing that. But I think it is incumbent on us to ensure that we use that space efficiently that we measure our utilization and that uh, realizing how finite space is in an academic, urban academic health center, that we're constantly trying to do our best to use it as we will likely expand our footprint of clinical space in the next two to three years. <laughs> we also have to grow our program by identifying operational efficiencies. Now these three domains are the plain obvious stuff that we do as clinicians. Um, but are critically vital to our growth and our efficiency. One, make Smilo Ho Cancer Hospital the choice of cancer care for patients, families, and referring providers. Secondly, to optimize access for patients and families as well as for referring physicians. And thirdly, once they're here, 
to ensure that they want to stay here, that we retain those patients. Now, um, I'm going to talk about the first box a little bit later in the context of marketing communications, but with regard to access and retention, um, I think there's a number of things that over the coming months we should think about. Uh, a number of cancer centers have now begun to offer to patients and families the phenomenon of next day access. Now, I can tell you when I presented that idea in my earlier job in Boston, I probably needed to wear body armor when I suggested it to a cadre of clinicians because it's a fairly frightening thought to imagine that you should be prepared to see every patient the next day. The majority, we actually did it, and I can tell you the majority of patients don't want it. But there are some patients who need it. And moreover, it is a value proposition that I think uh, that patients, families, and preferring providers like to see, and it's something we should contemplate here at Yale. Um, we uh, need to coordinate the points of entry into our system. We need to ease access to scheduling. We have to ensure that we provide easy access to multidisciplinary care. Um, we have to provide easy access for referring providers, and I think we always have to make sure that we have available for patients and referring physicians information on our clinical trials and technologies. And at the same time, I think we want to measure the access that is measure this process by which patients get in so we can ensure that we provide the best possible service for our patients and doctors who are looking to send patients to us. At the same time, we've got to see how we're doing once the patients are through the front door. We have to make sure, as I mentioned, that we're maximally using our staffing model and our space utilization in clinic. And we similarly have to use the things that I mentioned, which is making sure that we provide access to clinical trials, that we incorporate treatment pathways, that we provide rapid uh, and informative genomic profiling, that we ensure the availability and awareness to a variety of support services that patients and families are keenly interested in and expect at a tertiary or quaternary center. And through all of this, we need to monitor this. Uh, you know, I think most centers actually don't ask the question of, well, when a patient comes here for a visit, how often do they come back for a second? And these are things that I actually think we need to monitor because it really does measure how good we are in providing the care that our patients deserve. Our, our network, as I mentioned, is a, uh, a, a real measure of success. Now, I think may, most NCI comprehensive cancer centers have struggled a bit with this phenomenon because it's different. So um, this is something that has evolved, having network sites or care centers at most major cancer centers. But you know, to be clear, 85% of Americans receive their cancer care in a community center, not in an academic center. Probably 12% get an academic center. And I think that as leaders in cancer care and cancer research, it is incumbent on in us to be leaders in this venue. So I think the, what has been done should be applauded, and for that matter, I would say is the model. Namely, what we have seen over the past five years is exemplary execution of the phenomenon of having a Smilo Center within 30 minutes of any patient across the state of Connecticut. Um, I think we have emerged now as the premier provider of cancer care in the state, and what I think is now emerging is that we are a model of seamless care across the network. Nonetheless, there's always the opportunity to further promote communication and standardization uh, between our tertiary and community sites. I think we have to regularly revisit the model of recruiting physicians to our care centers. And we probably need to expand that model into other disciplines, namely radiation oncology and surgery. Um, we also have to think about beyond the sites that we are currently at is there are there areas that we could expand to. Um, and this was actually work by that executive management consulting firm, ECG, looking at uh, various parameters to see what would be in the region opportunities to spread to, and as you can see, there's a lot of circles, all of which are in Fairfield County and Westchester County. No surprise, you probably could have said, well, I could have figured that out without hiring a management consulting firm, but at least I guess it confirms our suspicion. So ultimately, I think there are these areas 
that we would all agree that we want to expand the footprint of our outstanding care to and to engage patients and referring providers in those areas. So, you know, as I mentioned, um, having sat at meetings uh, up north uh, where Connecticut looks like an, a prime opportunity for expansion and having talked to my colleagues a little bit south who see the world similarly, um, there is going to be growing competition that really builds on our extraordinary success. And I really do see Lower Fairfield County as an opportunity. You know, others might even refer to it as a threat. That is to say, if we don't actually do it, well, others will. I would like to focus more on the positive than the negative. But I think, nonetheless, we have to be firmly committed to doing this. Uh, we have no choice but to ensure that as we think about our network, that we expand into that region. The other challenges our network faces is that um, there's been aggressive merger and acquisitions of various hospitals, not necessarily part of our network, that might affect some of our care centers. And these are things we're going to have to be aware of. There are regulatory barriers uh, that are growing in terms of how many yards, miles you can be from your uh, major center. And we have to address those as we model this. And also, uh, we realize that even for uh, some of our other hospitals, they may not be following precisely the same paths that we follow, and we'll have to ensure there is uh, homogeneity of care. Um, and through all of it, I think we have to provide innovative solutions as we expand our network. So ultimately, I think first we need to look at our existing sites, make sure that we're capturing uh, that patient population properly, that those sites are adequately resourced and staffed, but at the same time, consider the opportunities for growth beyond that. I think we have to look at newer opportunities, solutions for recruiting physicians, particularly Again. physicians who will be engaged in our research mission at the care center, though I th want to be clear, our care centers are really the model not only in care, but actually in enrollment in clinical trials, which is really unprecedented, and we want to build on that. We also want to continually think about how we further strengthen the, prop the value proposition of our network in terms of seamless coordination of care, as, and as well the capacity to even further expand the footprint for clinical research, including novel research, where such things as pharmacokinetics and other elements for more complicated trials can be conducted, conducted not only here, but at our care center, so we can provide that service to patients across the region. And finally, this is something that every health system is now thinking about because it will be imposed on us as we expand the networks, as we leverage these care centers, we'll have to start to think about where is the best place for a particular treatment. In certain circumstances, it'll have to be here at Smilo, but uh, at the Yale campus. In others, it might be better served at the network. And so we need to make those decisions and think about the continuum of care as we move forward in our clinical enterprise. Turning, of course, to the research, which is so vitally important to our mission, I think we also realize that the, the area, this area has evolved as well. You know, when I started, it was essentially, well, you know, you identify the gene, an oncogene, or some other event, and you presume that you understood the cancer. But we realize that it's much more complicated than that, that it includes the epigenome, the metabolome, the proteome, that's really driving oncogenesis, cancer progression, and as well the questions of treatment. As well, I think we anticipated that, well, much like the successes we had with CML and, and GIS, that a, a drug that targets a particular gene, gene would do it. And in select cases, it really has made the difference. But in fact, in most circumstances, it's not adequate. And it's really about understanding the entire microenvironment around the tumor. And certainly our successes in immunobiology and immuno-oncology, where Yale is certainly a leader, is an example of how understanding the microenvironment has been leveraged towards the improvement of patient care. And, and ultimately, I think where we all recognize cancer research is going is that it now requires the uh, collection the, uh, the installation of increasingly large volumes of complex data and having the ability, the informatics, to interrogate those databases. So being able to store and analyze big data is a capacity 
that we absolutely have to have here if we are to advance the mission of cancer research. We've actually, I think, over the past two years been able to grow our research funding. As you know, there was a bit of a dip in NCI funding, but it's on the way back, and I think uh, hopefully it will continue to grow over the next years to come. And as well, we saw a similar phenomenon in total cancer funding, but as you can see, last year we exceeded $124 million in total cancer funding, and I'm looking forward to going beyond that again this year. We really have an outstanding group of leaders and program leaders in our cancer center, and as you may be aware, in November, we had our ESAB come to review us, and what they told us is that we continue to make great progress, demonstrating great impact and great science, and they mentioned that that occurred even during an 18-month transition plan before a new director was installed, which I think is a credit to all of you and to Peter Shulam and his leadership of our center. The other thing they told us, which is I guess both good and bad, is that they think we're in a good place to submit our Cancer Center grant in September of this year, which is a tall order, but one that I'm pleased to do because one, I, I was involved in the submission of the Farber grant last year, so I got a little practice so I, can, I was warmed up for this year, but also because I actually think that preparing this grant will give us all an opportunity to really do a thorough vetting and evaluation of our research programs, of where we want to take the science. So in fact, I think this exercise of submitting the grant will be vitally important as we think through the strategic initiatives we want to muster for our cancer center. But I, you know, I thank all of those of you that are working on this grant. There's a lot more work to go. And for those of you who are unaware, the rules have changed. The, the, uh, the Cancer Center Support Grant is now one of the unique circumstances where your score actually defines the amount of money you get. And, and so if we get a score less than 20, we could potentially double the amount of money we get in the grant. So we really have to work doubly hard because uh, we want to get the best score, not only because we deserve it and because we have outstanding science, but because there's really dollars behind it. <clears throat> the feedback we did get from the ASAB were, were worthwhile. And in fact, a number of us shared this with the dean yesterday about areas for investment uh, that I think we all agree, well, namely I research on the microbiome, creating a center for immune oncology within our cancer Wait, immunology oh. program to commit to some novel technologies like single cell analyses, which really allow us to understand tumor heterogeneity, to always invest in mentored research, mentored training grants, diversity and health equity, uh, as I mentioned earlier, cancer survivorship and end of life care. And um, as we submit, put out the RFAs for our pilot and co-pilot fundings, these areas are priorities, particularly as we get ready to submit our grant in September. So aim two, ultimately, is to strengthen Yale's position as a leader in cancer research, covering the full spectrum of investigation while ensuring integration and coordination across our clinical and research community. Um, part of that is an investment that fortunately preceded me and a, recruit, a key recruitment that preceded me, namely Mark Lemon, and the recruitment to the Cancer Biology Institute. And as may, many of you may have seen from the emails and seminar announcements, Mark is furiously wor working to bring in some really outstanding people who I think will be great for the Cancer Biology Institute and really move forward uh, the vital mission of our cancer center. And a number of us are committed to working with Mark uh, to fill that building and to really engage those scientists in what we're doing on both campuses. And as we continue to build the great depth and strength of our basic research and build our clinical enterprise, we'll also have to figure out how to fill that gap between the basic and the clinical. And that obviously, in part, I think, is through recruitment of physician scientists. We certainly have a cadre of outstanding physician scientists, but what I would like to propose is that over the next two to three years, we recruit seven to 10 physician scientists who are focused on key areas of cancer research, with many of which may have a specific disease focus, and will ultimately allow us to innovate from the basic to the clinical. 
And I think having this cadre of individuals, potentially even with a specific center dedicated to physician scientists within our cancer center, will greatly augment not only the portfolio of research we have, what I think will really move the needle on translation. And as some of you may know, we've already started to bring in some individuals. We've created an oversight committee of, of, uh, to, to, to lead this physician scientist search. And um, we will likely engage many of you because one committee is probably not, doesn't have the bandwidth to necessarily work through the seven to 10 recruits. So we'll probably create modules of individuals focused on key areas. In terms of the areas to consider, I think, well, it's an open discussion. To some extent, well, it'll be best athlete if we identify an extraordinary physician scientist independent of their area of interest, that may be somebody we want, but there also may be key strategic areas and high prevalent diseases or areas that we wanna build on existing strengths where we'll wanna find superb physician scientists. But the space, the commitment is now there and we're moving forward on that. At the same time, I think we want to build the infrastructure in terms of centers that can leverage our basic and clinical science together and build translation. Um, it was actually suggested by the SAB, and I would agree that within our extraordinary strength in immunobiology, our cancer immunology program, to actually have a dedicated center for immuno-oncology, and I look forward to working with the leaders in immunobiology and immuno-oncology to create that center. Clearly, precision medicine is an important area as well as genomic discovery, and I think within that, having the capacity to do things like single-cell RNA-seq and other technologies should be part of that and something we want to invest in. I mentioned to you, I think that the rate-limiting step for many of our analyses is computational biology. There is an emerging field, uh, I don't know if you've heard the phrase, computational oncology. Um, I think it works, and bottom line is we need it. Um, so I think investing, recruiting bioinformatics for our cancer center, as well as biostatistics, will be essential if we're to achieve what we want in the ability to anal analyze an increasing large amount of data. And then at the same time, as I mentioned, akin to our metric-driven care commitment, that we should commit to expanding cancer outcomes to align both our clinical and research mission. As I mentioned, uh, accrual to clinical trials has uh, quadrupled, uh, essentially, over the past five to six years, which is an extraordinary accomplishment for any cancer center, and we want to expand on that. So what I would propose is that we invest in this to allow even greater growth, namely, as you can see, a 40% growth in enrollment over the next two years. And I'm committed to ensuring that we have in place the people and the support uh, to do that. Um, and most importantly, we want to advance Yale science into the clinic. Now, to do that, I think we have to ensure that we have the resources both at this site and the network to do it. We have to make sure that we have the best staffing model, and I think we have to look at that as well, and we have to look at our processes. As many of you know, may know, Peter Shulam championed the process with a consulting firm impact to actually look at our process for study activation, really from soups to nuts, and that is ongoing, and I can tell you they're making progress. But concurrent, beyond the activation process, I think we need to thoroughly look at our staffing model to ensure that we're doing it in the best way. I think people here are doing outstanding work, and we just want to increase that capacity uh, beyond what we've already achieved. We also want to ensure that we have the infrastructure to advance translational research. Uh, and I think this is cru a crucial need, namely that is to do this, that we uh, ensure that patients are routinely consented at patient registration to allow us to use their archive tissue for research and genomic analyses, that those samples are entered into a interrelational database that we can all interrogate that we also allow the creation of tumor banks that we can all access, that we actually have the capacity in a selective manner to build a living tumor bank of cell lines and PDX models to advance our research, and that at the same time we implement the IT systems to allow us to interrogate all of this and know what's precisely available as we contemplate new initiatives, new grants, 
And this is something that Joanne Sweezy has uh, graciously volunteered to chair a committee that will ultimately create the infrastructure um, to ensure that we have the ability to do translation research um, from the very beginning, that is the mundane part of making sure that patients are consented to ensure that we have the resources and the databases to interrogate. We also have to make sure that we can allow pilot work, um, that we, the nascent ideas here are supported. These are the current uh, funding mechanisms that we have, and I think they have each shown tremendous return on investment. And my goal is to expand this. As I mentioned to you, the pilot and co-pilot RFAs, which are recently put out, are going to be focused on those components that the ESAB has recommended we invest in, and that will further our Cancer Center Support Grant application this September. But ultimately, we want the best science to percolate up, and we want to support that into new collaborative grants and new initiatives at Yale. So. Um, Ultimately, I think if we do all of this, we really can then follow the continuous science from the very basic discovery to improving clinical care and clinical outcomes. And that moreover, that we have the resources not only to take Yale science in the clinic, but through rebiopsies, through on-treatment biopsies, that we can retest our hypotheses to understand in the lab mechanisms of sensitivity and resistance to ensure vertical and linear integration uh, between the basic and clinical research. Um, another key component, as you can see, is to ensure that we have a comprehensive program that recruits, retains, mentors, faculty, administrators, trainees, staff, and ensures communication and engagement of all sites. And I think for any large and growing organization, this is something we really have to always be focused on. Namely, we want to make sure that we facilitate faculty and staff participation in all decision-making initiatives um, to empower people to feel like they're part of the solution as opposed to feeling like they don't have a say in when the problems arrive, arise. We have to make sure there is a transparent promotion process, that there's a fair system for compensation across all disciplines, and that uh, we honor our clinicians beyond our scientists and that through all of it, we ensure a training program that retains and mentors people and ultimately has them become successful clinicians, researchers, and staff in all of the endeavors that we now do in our cancer center. Um, I think a key component of this, and forgive me because it's spring training in baseball, but we have to invest in our farm system. We're nothing if we don't have a strong program that mentors and supports our trainees these are some of the areas that we currently have available to us. Um, I know that Harriet and Melinda are also putting forth new training grants. And beyond that, I want to identify other discretionary means to support our training programs across all disciplines to ensure that we, uh, we attract the best and the brightest to our training programs at Yale and that we mentor them to be outstanding faculty and staff. Yale certainly has a complex, I'm pleased to say Harvard's not the only one, a complex method for promotion of faculty and research scientists, certainly that I think honors the accomplishments of our faculty and research scientists. And so for those people who fit those tra tracks, I, I think it works. We want to make sure that it is transparent and that people have a good sense of how they're doing on these ladders. But at the same time, I think one thing that a number of academic centers are struggling with is how do you recognize your incredibly strong and, and accomplished clinicians? Because for the most part, candidly, I'm not sure that academic promotion systems, as in the Harvard-Yale model, necessarily adequately uh, values those people. So what have some institutions done, including one that I recently came from, was to create a parallel system in which everyone who touches a patient gets an, another rank, which is a clinical rank, not necessarily recognized by the university, but has the same process of review, of recognition, of gravitas. And here's an example of a system we put place in my last job, namely physician, senior physician, institute physician, for which there was a review process, for which outstanding clinicians, be it either on the main campus or a network site, were valued. And I think it really is important that we put in place something like this, 
not only to recognize our care center docs, but the folks here at this campus as well who are providing outstanding care. Um, those folks may get promoted through the system, but at the same time, to the extent that it's a little slower for them to get to the rank of professor, um, I think we need to recognize those individuals as the highest level of physicians that we, we, can, uh, we can offer. And frankly, beyond just our clinicians, our, our physicians rather, we want to think about similarly valuing the accomplishments of other disciplines. And ultimately, I think by doing this, um, we engage all staff, we ensure operational efficiency, we facilitate staff development and retention, and we promote a culture of planning, teamwork, and collaboration that I think will be incredibly valued at all levels of the organization. And then finally, and no less importantly, is to develop a sound, transparent, and coordinated business model to provide sustainable resources to achieve our vision as we are now referring to it. Now that's in part through ensuring uh, appropriate compensation models, but also business plans that advance all of these things and are sustainable. But at the same time, as we expand our mission, as we get increasingly ambitious and realizing that insurance companies, funding agencies are not as generous as they once were, that we have to further expand our development. And so I was given approval by both the hospital and the school to create a new consolidated office of development for the cancer enterprise, which I welcome working with our outstanding development staff and moreover working with all of you. Because I want to tell you that I think that $30 million for the cancer center should be an okay year. And a good year should be $100 million. Um, I can tell you, uh, and I, I'm not necessarily thrilled about this fact, is the guy who inherits my job at the Dana-Farber is going to have $35 million in the bank. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard work, but it makes a big difference. And these are the kind of things to advance all of these initiatives uh, we want to do with the proper resources. Finally, I think uh, we, we have to think about branding. This is who we are. Um, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, I sort of wrote two different uh, value statements, value propositions, because we are technically two organizations, but closely aligned, but we are a few other things. <laughs> and I think it is important, although our brand has simplified, it needs to be even simpler. Uh, I think patients, referring providers, researchers nationally, internationally should identify us in a single way. And I think that's something we probably do need to think about um, and keep it as simple as possible. Um, this is a statistic I'm not particularly thrilled about showing, but I think it's something we have to recognize. Namely, I, I, have, no, I have no belief that US News and Reports has any idea of what they're doing or whether it reflects reality. Um, but, um, and despite the fact that I've shown you the great data of our success over the past five years, look at this trend. So um, it's something we have to work on. Now, if you actually look at the data, and maybe some of you have, this is actually our neighboring centers. Um, and what's incredible is if you look at 50 versus 17, it's, it's marginal in terms of its difference. And in earnest, if we just moved a few points, we'd be probably in the high teens. In fact, our reputation score at 2.5 is higher than almost every other major center, save perhaps the two on the far right. So we're doing OK. Um, for those of you who know, uh, doximity voting uh, is likely to start in the next week. You know, free, Vote early and vote often. Uh, this is incumbent on us to ensure that our reputation store remains 2.5 and hopefully goes up to 3. But we want to make sure that gets fixed, because it is not reflective of who we are and how great we are. Um, and we want to make sure that the world knows it. So this is an interesting analysis that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine this past fall that looked at advertising in major media markets by cancer centers. And as you can see, it's growing at a fairly significant pace. This is actually the, the, uh, the payments, uh, the expenditures among the top 20. What's impressive is that Cancer Treatment Centers of America account for 59% of all advertising in, among cancer centers in the US. Isn't that incredible? 
at almost $102 million in 2014. It's not a game I necessarily love to play, but you know we're a great center and people need to know it and we have to participate. And so we want to, I think, extend our brand recognition. We want to revisit branding as I described. I think we want to continue to develop creative campaigns and earn media, which is namely when every time one of you publishes a great paper or makes a great observation, we want to make sure the world knows it. And we want to invest in having the people in place to ensure that that earned media, that the world knows about the accomplishments at this center on a daily basis. So a number of things we want to do. Um, I'm, I'm at, we're running out of time, so I'm going to rush through them. But, but ultimately, a number of strategies we want to do to promote this center that are as important as all the other things because we want the world to know it. At, um, at a retreat last week, um, we focused on the clinical side of our strategy, and we covered all of those domains. And I can tell you that at our, at our retreat, our cancer center retreat, um, as part of our work on the cancer center grant, I think we'll want to similarly revisit all of these strategies in, within our, our research enterprise. But ultimately, I, want to, I opened with a business school paper, and I want to close with a business school analysis, namely the story of Eastman Kodak. For those of you who don't know, George Eastman uh, founded Kodak at the beginning of the 20th century, and the guy was a visionary. He took what was a very lucrative business of flat plate photography and said, we're going to can that, and we're going to invest everything in film. And it was a genius move. Moreover, he invested in the little things, like the, how the cameras were designed, and ultimately became a world leader. When he realized he was paying too much for chemicals for his film, he founded under his own name, Eastman Chemical, which was a subsidiary of Kodak, uh, and used that to cover the costs of his chemicals. In 1975, Kodak actually invented the first digital camera. But what they neglected to do was actually realize that that was actually an important invention. And they ignored it. And then ultimately, uh, they having failed to follow that, they sort of lost their way. But at the same time, in 1994, they decided they didn't need a chemical company, company anymore. The chemicals were cheap. So they spun off Eastman Chemical, a small company that probably had an uncertain future and was unlikely to really compete with the giants. But in fact, through innovation, through thinking about new technologies, Eastman Chemical became a $12 billion corporation, and Kodak is on its last legs listed technically at a $500 million company, probably less. And so I think the, the, less, the cautionary tale is, yeah, we've, we're great at science, we've had tremendous success clinically, but we should not rest on our laurels because it's easy to be a Kodak. But at the same time, we're, we're, we can be an Eastman. There may be things that we think that other centers um, can now compete on us. We'll forget it because we're Yale, and we're going to be smart, nimble, and innovative, and we're going to compete on a national and an international level. So where are we going? I think we have to relentlessly advance cancer care and research and be a recognized leader. We have to continuously innovate and define our value proposition. We have to continuously bring together all parts of our enterprise towards a common goal. We must optimally apply resources and pursue sustainable business models. And we have to obviously focus on development. And no less importantly, we have to be bold and aggressive. Um, I'm very excited for the future. We have a commitment from the university, from the hospital, to invest in our center, to move the needle both clinically and research and education. And I think the next five years are going to be pretty exciting. So I'll stop there and answer any questions.